But saying that, we live in some real trying times, and you know, life is changing. It's changing at a rapid, rapid pace, and unfortunately, and I'm not trying to be a doomist, I'm just trying to be a realist, it's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. You say, Pastor, that sounds kind of depressing. Well, it's not depressing if we know who Jesus is, and if we know who we are in Jesus. But life as it used to be is gone. It's never going to reset. It's never going to get back to the life that we once loved and once cherished. And, you know, you look around and fear abounds in everybody's heart, it seems. Seems like there's so much uncertainty. People are anxious. People are taking more pills than ever. They're going to see counselors and psychiatrists more than ever in the whole entire history of the world. Seems like our challenges are, are greater than they've ever been before in life. Seems like we're having more friction in our marriages, more friction with our kids in our relationships. And it's become a very, very angry world. And there's so many people that, if they're honest, would say, you know, Pastor, I feel like I'm at my wit's end. But I want us in all of the things that I just got through saying, I want us to remember this. Never underestimate, and I say again, never underestimate the power of God. Amen. Never underestimate the power of God. There is nothing ahead of you or ahead of me this morning that is greater or bigger than Jesus Christ. There's nothing that you are presently facing that is bigger or stronger than Jesus Christ. This doesn't mean this morning that we're not going to have our challenges. This doesn't mean that we're not going to have our intimidating things that come up in our life or threatening things or even things sometimes that we feel like are going to overwhelm us. But it does mean this. There is nothing greater than who Jesus is. You know, when people hear the name of John Wayne, and I had to use that. When people hear the name of John Wayne, they think that that name is associated with, and you may disagree with me, and if you do, you're wrong. He is the greatest Western actor that ever lived. That's non-debatable in this church. <laughs> Debate it all you want to at home. But here, do not differ with what I just said. When people think of the name MJ, they think about probably the greatest basketball player that ever played. And of course, he was from the University of North Carolina. Amen. For all of you Yankees out there. When people think about the name of Dick Buckfuss as he just passed this week, they think about one of the most fearful, one of the most meanest, greatest, all-pro champion football players that ever laced him up on the football field. You know, you would never ever think about naming your kid Hitler. Why? Because you, name, you know what his name is associated with. You would never ever think about naming your kid Judas Iscariot because you know what his name is associated with. Names have significance. And Jesus wants you to understand this morning that there is something about the name of Jesus. And that's what I want us to look at this morning, and I want this message today to be, I pray, an unbelievable, encouraging moment in your life, because I think all of us need some encouragement this morning. Amen? I want to give you three encouraging principles that I pray that you will listen very attentively to, and that you will maybe take some notes if you want to, but let this just sink into your heart this morning, and you can follow along in your notes. Number one, 
Jesus or he delights in standing with us when the odds are not in our favor. We're going to be looking this morning at a story that shares with us that regardless of what's going on in our life, that God is in complete control. We're going to be looking at a story that it looks like all of the odds were stacked against this particular army. Everybody thought that they were going to be absolutely wiped off the face of the map. But as we can see, and we'll see, God was right in the midst of all of the chaos, like he's in the midst of all of our chaos. Look, if you would, at 1 Kings chapter 20, verses 1 through 5. About that time, King Benadad of Aram mobilized his army, supported by the chariots and horses of 32 allied kings. They went to besiege Samaria, the capital of Israel, and launched attacks against it. Benadad sent his messengers into the city to relay this message to King Ahab of Israel. This is what Benadad says. Your silver and gold are mine, and so are your wives and the best of your children. All right, my lord the king, Israel kings replied, all that I have is yours. In other words, King Ahab was, he was intimidated by Benadad. 32 allied kings, 32 Kings and nations and armies were forming an alliance and they were coming against Israel. And when Ahab looked at this, he said, okay, everything that we have, we're just going to go ahead and just go ahead and give it over to you. And then it says, soon Benadad's messengers returned again and said, this is what Benadad says, I have already demanded that you give me your silver and your gold and your wives and your children. May I say to you this morning that odds mean nothing when it comes to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Everybody may say the odds are against you this morning. Everybody may say that the deck, the deck is stacked against you this morning. But that means nothing to God. Our impossibilities mean absolutely nothing to him. Amen. It doesn't make any difference how big you think your impossibilities and challenges and issues are in life. When it's compared to the name above all names, they're nothing. Amen. Absolutely nothing. And Jesus delights this morning in handling our impossibilities. He takes delight in that. Like he takes delight in what we're reading here this morning. Sometimes the odds are not in our favor. We have difficult situations. We have what we think are impossible challenges. We have heart-wrenching moments in our life. And we have things that if we're honest about it, maybe at this morning are about ready to blow you, blow your family into a million, million different pieces. And some, if they're honest, would say, you know what, Pastor, I am to the point where I just cannot take it anymore. The best thing we can do when we're like that is to invite him into our mess. We send out a lot of invitations in life. Come and join us here. Come and join us here. But we don't think about a lot of times the greatest invitation that you and me can ever send out as a Christian. And that is when all hell is breaking loose in our life, we need to realize that immediately we need to invite the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the name that is above every name, we need to invite him into our mess. And when we do, here's what happens. He steps in. He steps in. Amen? When it looks like we're going down for the last count, when it looks like there's no hope at all, we send out an invitation to him. 
And he hears that invitation. He hears our cry for help, whatever it might be. We may have lost a loved one and we may feel like that we cannot go on in life and we send an invitation to him to heal our broken hearts. We may feel like that we are in other desperate situations in life. We don't have the answers. We're about ready to be going down. And we send that invitation to him. And when we do, he always, always hears our calls for help. And he always steps in. And folks, when he steps in, he becomes a game changer in our life. And I will say to you this morning that I believe with all of my heart that the reason our lives are not changing, the reason we're not having victories, the reason we're so daggum depressed and so fearful today is because we are not sending out an invitation for him and inviting him to come in and change the mess that we're in. And understand this. He's not going to step in until you ask him to step in. Did you hear me? He is not. You say, where is he? He's the same place he's always been. Why is he still there? Because you haven't invited him to your mess. He will allow you and me to handle our mess on our own until we give him a personal invitation. We are battling things today that he is just waiting for us to get to the point where we will lose our stinking pride and invite him to come in to do what we can't do. Amen. And folks, when he does, the game changes. Amen. Denzel Washington is not the real equalizer. Jesus is. Amen? He is the equalizer. You think Denzel Washington's bad? You invite Jesus to come in to your mess. Folks, he has a way of leveling the playing field. He has a way of defeating Satan and sending him back to hell like you would not believe. He has a way of showing up for his children. He has a way of saying, not today, Satan, they are mine. He has a way of saying, that is enough. And when I say that's enough, you always understand that's enough. Did you hear me? You leave your hands off my kids. But there again, we have to invite him to take care of our mess. Amen? I remember when I was in elementary school, I think I was about in the fifth grade or so, sixth grade. I was a big old boy. And the reason I was is because I was a milk boy in elementary school. Now, if some of y'all don't understand what a milk boy is. Let me tell you what a milk boy is. I volunteered to be the milk boy. When I went to school, there was two kinds of milk. One that was unholy and one that was holy. I'm not talking about 2% because back in them days, they were all right with God and everything was whole milk. You couldn't find any 2% or skin. Everybody was right with God. But as times changed. But anyway, back to my elementary school. I, invo I volunteered to be the milk boy. The milk boy would go to the cafeteria and would tell the lady in the cafeteria how much milk you needed. You either got white milk, which was ungodly, or you got chocolate, which was anointed of God. I was a mean kid. I told you that. I volunteered for this reason. When I would go and I would share with the lady at the cafeteria how many milks we needed, the number of chocolate milks increased Probably maybe five or six. I don't know. I don't remember. The lady in the cafeteria, she was so sweet. She, she just loved me to death. She knew what I was doing. 
But she let it go because she knew I was a boy in need. (laughs) She knew that milk was essential to my life. Chocolate milk was essential. Well, I needed all the sweetness I could get, plus my bones. I had to build healthy bones. So she gave me chocolate milk, and I would drink probably four or five of them things before I got back to my classroom. I would throw the empties in the trash can, and when I got back to my classroom, I even had the audacity to drink the chocolate milk that was really ordered for me. I kind of lost my train of thought where I was going with this. In fact, I completely lost my train of thought where I was going with this. I don't really remember where I was going with that. I guess we'll do it like this. When we get in a mess, forgive me, Lord. When we get in a mess, you see, you know, when I get off on them food tangents sometimes, I just just go on down the road. I did have a point that I was going to bring on that, and if it hits me later on, I'll bring it back. I know what it was. I'm looking here in my notes, and I'm giving you, I'm going to give you an example of Jesus coming in to a situation. And the note that I got here in big letters says feeding, so I immediately thought of something food-wise. Impossibilities is where God shows up. Feeding the 5,000. I knew I'd get to it. Feeding the 5,000. He was faced with an impossibility, was he not? The little boy shows up with the loaves and he shows up with the fishes and you got 5,000 there and there was really more than 5,000 because 5,000 was just counting the adults. It wasn't counting the children. And Jesus, right in the middle of the whole thing, he sets up a long John Silver's. You say he did? Yeah, he did. That was the first establishment known to man right there. He set it up. They had more fish. They had more taters than they could possibly handle. And probably cornbread. But Jesus set it up right there. They thought that he couldn't do it, and look what he did. You come up on the Red Sea. It was another impossibility, and Moses says... There's no problem because you know what? We have a friend that we're going to invite into this mess. And it is not just somebody named a name. It is a name above all names. And his name is Jesus. Come on into our mess. And what did he do? He split the sea, Red Sea, and they walked on dry ground. Now, I know some liberals out there, I'll tell you, they've researched this. And they will say that at that particular time, the the Red Sea was not the Red Sea, it was a Reed Sea, and it was only six foot deep. Somebody told me one of those things one day, and I thought for a minute, and God gave me a bit of divine wisdom. And And they were trying to tell me that God wasn't God, and I said to them, no, you don't understand. Because if it really was the Red Sea, and it was six foot deep, God did even a bigger miracle in drowning all them folks. Amen? Amen. But God did the impossibility. And Daniel, when he was thrown into the fire with those three Hebrew boys, King thought that he had it done. But they said, wait a minute, we're in a mess We know somebody. And who was it? The name which is above all names. They invited him into their mess. And they yelled up at the king. They said, there is a fourth man here in this fire. I thought about a song that I had heard, and it's talked about, I know my God can do it. It says three Hebrew boys were thrown into a fire because before the king they would not bow. But they said, listen, king, let it be known. We serve a living God. We are not alone. It says, well, I know my God can do it. To him 
There is nothing to it. I know he'll see you through it. Sweet victory. Even when storms are raging, he is the rock of ages. I know that he is able. Mighty is he. What if we would say that this morning? What if we would say, devil, you know what? I, am, I know you're throwing everything at me except for the kitchen sink. I know that you are trying your best to destroy me, destroy things around me. You are accusing me. You are lying to me. You are doing everything you possibly can. But I want you to know something. There is somebody else in this mess. And that somebody else is the name above all names. And his name is Jesus. He is the rock of ages. He is more than a conqueror. He is the one and awesome God. He is my Savior. He's my Heavenly Father. I want to tell you something. I know that He is mighty, and He is going to give me victory right here and right now. Amen. King Ahab and Israel were in a mess. But you know what God did? He sent a preacher to them with a powerful, powerful word. It says this, number two, when you put limits on your faith and your potential and your possibilities, you are limiting what God can do and what he may do. Listen, it's not just about his ability. It's also about our faith. Our situations and circumstances have nothing to do with his ability to take care of it. Amen. He's always there. But again, we have got to invite him to our mess. There is no place today that God isn't. Did you get that? There's no place that he isn't. Pastor, is he with me? Yes, he is. Why? Because he's always promised to be. Why? Because he said he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you. He is there, but he has to be invited to take care of it. There's no season that God is not in season. There is no time that God is not present. There's no place that life can ever push us that he will not show up if he's asked. Amen? There's no place. There's no circumstance, there's no situation, there's no challenge. Nothing can come our way. I want you to get this this morning. Nothing can come our way that he will not show up if he's asked. Amen. Folks, we have got power, 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 wonder-working power in the blood if we will just open up our mouth and ask for it. Amen. And God doesn't get it when we don't. I talk to so many people every single week that say the same old thing over and over and over and over again. Some folks are dealing with the same junk that you were dealing with last week. The same thing you were dealing with two weeks ago, three months ago, four months ago, six months, sometimes a year. You've been belly aching about the same thing. And the only reason you're belly aching is because you haven't invited him into your mess. And you don't get it. You don't get it. What would you say if all of the power of heaven, all the wisdom of heaven, everything that heaven had to offer in Jesus Christ, what would you say if he said to you, you can have it all, all you got to do is ask? You would have to be an absolute fool not to take advantage of that, wouldn't you? Amen? I know where I'm going with that story with the milk. <laughs> it just came back to me. Thank you, Jesus. See, you don't want me to forget. I told you I got some at Gene Cobo one day, like everybody told me to do. The only problem is I forgot where I put it. Some of y'all get that later. But anyway, I was in the fifth or sixth grade, and I was a big boy. And there was this little kid in my class. He was little. I mean, he could have tried out for the Munskins on the Wizard of Oz. And he'd have made it. 
He was short. He was small. That kid, he loved me so much. I was like a big brother to him. I forget his name. I was calling Munchkin. Anyway, he had a tendency of going out, on the, on, out in the playground and kids would pick on him. I mean, they'd pick on him and sometimes they'd, they'd fight him. And when they fought him, Munchkin couldn't, couldn't take care of himself. He couldn't swing a swing if he, hit, if he tried. One day, I remember, these big kids were beating up Munchkin. He was at the bottom of the pile. And you know what? God says, you need to go in there and you need to take care of business. So I walked over and I took care of business. I don't remember how many kids I had to knock off of him, but I do remember the last one that I threw off him. He thought he was something else. I won most of them fights in them days by sitting on people. I didn't have to throw a punch. This kid thought he was something, and I just knocked him down to the ground. And I sat on him. And folks, let me tell you something. When I sat on somebody, I mean, I was full of chocolate milk, and I was ready to roll. <laughs> Amen? I was sitting on him. And it was more than that feller could bear. And I told him, I said, I'm going to keep sitting here till you quit beating up on Munchkin. You've got to tell me you won't beat up on him no more. He says, I promise, Branson, I'll never touch Munchkin again. You know what? They never did. You know what? God has a way of showing up when we get, are getting beat up. Doesn't he? He has a way of changing everything. And we need to understand that it doesn't make any difference, again, what the odds are. Your God's going to show up, and when he shows up in your life, and when he shows up in mine, he is ready to take care of all of our impossibilities. Amen. There is no problem in this audience today that God can't take care of. There is no amount of problems that you can't solve through the wisdom of God. There is a directions that you and I need to have in life that we're places we need to be going and decisions we need to be making. And he is just waiting on us to ask him. And he's going to give us every single thing we need. If life pushes you to a scary place, the places of uncertainty in your life, understand something. God is not limited to his location. He's everywhere. Amen? He's the God of the mountaintops. He's the God of the valleys. And praise God, he is a God of all the in-betweens. Amen. There is no problem in our life that he will not invade. He is the answer. Amen. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 13. There was a certain prophet, we'll call him a preacher, that came to King Ahab of Israel and told him, this is what the Lord says. Do you see all these enemy forces? Today, I will hand them over to you. Then you will know that I am the Lord. The Lord has a word for us today, and I want you to listen to this. He's saying, listen. Do you see all of your problems? Listen. Open your eyes. Do you see all your problems? Do you see all your impossibilities? Do you see your challenges? Do you see them? Look at them. Look at how monumental they look. Look at how big Satan has magnified them in your life. Look at how fearful... He has made all these things. Look at them. Get a clear view of them. Now, here's what I want you to know. Today, right here, right now, I am going to take care of every single one of them. You hand them over to me, and I will take care of them. Period and amen. Amen. Ahab was facing all kinds of odds. And that prophet, we'll call him a prophet, we'll call him a preacher, came to 
Ahab and said, what in the world are you doing? Why are you folding your hands? Why are you admitting defeat? Why in the world are you acting like this? You know the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. What are you doing? I think God would ask us the same question today. What in the world are you doing? Listen, folks, listen to me. Either he is God or he's not. Did you hear me? Yeah. Yo, yeah, pastor, go get him. Say that on Wednesday. Say that on Thursday. Listen, he's either God that we worship or he's not. If he's the God that we say we know in our hearts that has saved us from our sin, he is the same God that can show up anytime, anywhere, if he's invited to our mess. We praise him on Sunday, and we act like he is a munchkin during the week. Amen? You say, well, wait a minute. I love Jesus. Well, show him. How do you show him? You show him by inviting him to fight your battles that you can't win. You invite him into your depression. You invite him into your fear. You invite him into your impossibilities and your challenges. You invite him into every single stinking thing that's causing all kinds of hell in your life. That's what you do. That's how you honor him. That's how you praise him. You know why? Because God allows times in our life, challenges, circumstances, situations that are completely get ready to blow us into a million pieces just so that we will invite him into our mess. Why? Because he wants the honor. He wants the glory. He wants your praise the Lord's. He wants your hallelujahs. He wants your thankfulness for what he is. Why? Because he wants you to glorify the name. There's above all names. Folks, if y'all don't start singing hallelujah and start praising the Lord in here, I'm going to start over. Not because I'm preaching this. God's preaching this through me. But I'll tell you, there's some truths coming out of here this morning that should blow your socks off. I'm looking at a bunch of folks right now. I'm telling you, I don't know where y'all going. Listen. Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm doing the very best I can this morning. Sometimes the only way he can show us that he's in control is to give us a situation that we can't control. And he's good at that. He's good about that in my life, and he's good about that in your life. He has a way of giving me situations in my life when I get to strutting a little bit too much that I get rid of my feathers, you know? Has he ever plucked some of your feathers out? Some of you get to be an old strutting bird. You know what a strutting bird is? Strutting bird gets out there in the barnyard, you know, and starts strutting around. Because they're, they're the chief strutter. All the other ones are just little strutters. Now, this is a big strutter. That strutter is so proud that it's just strutting. Some Christians sometimes start strutting. I've seen them. You've seen them. Oh, Yeah. You spend five minutes with them, you'll, let, you'll know who the king of, is in their life. It's them. Because all they do is talk about themselves. They want you to know that they're the king strutter. Well, listen. God says, I see you're strutting. Getting kind of happy, are you? A little bit prideful, right? Oh, you're really good. You know what? You're in the middle of a big, big mess right now. And you're not calling me. You know why? Because you're the big strutter. Oh, yeah. Just keep on strutting. Keep on strutting. You know, God hates a strutter. 
God hates when we try to handle things in our life and we don't invite Him into our mess. And you know what He does? He allows us to waller in it. Oh, yeah. You ever waller in the mud when you were a kid? Sometimes Jesus says, you ain't wallered enough. Get out there and get a little bit more muddy. Because the more muddier you get, the better you're going to feel, feel when you get in my shower and I clean you up. Now, some of y'all might be folks that only take a bath once a week. Now, if you are, the person next to you, the person in front of you and back has already identified you <laughs> as one of them. I was out in the yard the other day. Now, I get out in the yard, I, I get sweaty. I get, I get hot. I mean, it, it, it's just humid, and it's just messy, and you're weedy, and you edge, and you clean the bushes and spray the weed killer and you do all the stuff, blow off stuff. I mean, stuff gets all over you. Oh my gosh. You have a dirt just gets in some unsightly places. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I won't go into that. But anyway, it gets all over you. It gets sticky. And I look at myself sometimes and I think, that gum, what in the world happened to me? I mean, I am so dirty. When I walk into the house, I walk in very quietly because I don't even want my dolls to sniff me because I think they'll roll over and be dead for 10 minutes. <laughs> I hurry as fast as I can to the shower. I got one of them La Fleur things. What do they call them things? What do they call it, Vicky? A loofer? A what? A loofah. No wonder that woman in Target didn't know what I was talking about. I'm from North Carolina. I went in there and told one of that woman I want a loofer. She looked at me and she just said, I don't think we have any of those. I said, I know you got to. I got to have a new loofer. Anyway, now I know. It's a Lufour. So I go in the next time I say, can you give me a Lufour? Used to be, used to be, what, I still got it wrong? Forget it. Anyway, I'm, give me a sponge. Give me one of them bristle things. Used to be, it was good enough to hold a bar of soap in your hand, ivory soap, but now, I want to try my best to be politically correct when I'm taking a bath. I get one of them Lufour things. And I, and I put that, squeezing that soft soap on it, you know. And I tell you, when that soft soap gets in that Lufour, that goes into all them little tangles and things in there. and It's amazing. Because when you squash that against your skin, it just lets out all kinds of soap stuff. There ain't nothing like being dirty, stepping in the shower of a loofer and some body soap. It feels so good because when you get out, I'm amazing. I'm clean. Amen? I'm clean. My dogs come up and go, they love me. Everybody loves me because I'm clean. Nothing better than feeling clean. It's smelling good. There are some of us that need to take a holy shower today. You wonder where I was going, didn't you? We need to take a holy shower. We need to get under the raindrops of the Holy Spirit doing a little bit of cleaning in our life. We need to invite him into our mess. And we need to get clean with him. 
And we need to say to ourselves, you know, there ain't nothing like being clean and right with my Heavenly Father. And there ain't nothing like knowing that I'm right with Him because when I'm right with Him, I can tackle anything through His power that comes my way in life. How do you know that? You know that because of what God has done in your life and my life in the past. Think about it for a second. How many victories have you had in your life that you can account 100% to Jesus that were impossibilities before Jesus stepped in your mess? How many life changes are there in this room today and those that are listening that God has completely done a 180 degree turn miracle, hallelujah, in your life that is absolutely, that people said was completely impossible. You are a miracle of God. God stepped inside your mess. How many bad health reports are there here this morning? Doctors said you were down for the count, but praise God, God came in and healed you. He stepped into your mess. How many of y'all has God given wisdom to that has just been divine, absolutely beyond your natural intellect to make decisions in your life that have just transpired in your life and absolutely transformed your life and you say it had to be God, Pastor? How about financial issues that he's solved? All the odds are against you. Things aren't going to go right. And then Jesus came into your mess. How many healed marriages are there out there today? Healed relationships with your kids that you gave him an invitation and he came in and he did the impossible in your life. And I say to you today, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It does not make any difference how hard the storm rages. He is the same rock of ages. Don't let Satan tell you that the power or the ability of your God has been diminished. Don't let him tell you that your impossibilities are impossibilities. When you invite God into your impossibilities, they become possibilities. Amen. 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 He is the light of the world. Let him in to your dark moments today. If you don't know Jesus today as your Lord and Savior, you don't understand a thing I'm saying. And why? Because your eyes are blinded to the true power of who God really is. I want to tell you who he is. He's the God that can change your mess today. He's the God that can give you hope when there's no hope. He's a God that can give you heaven when you deserve hell. He's a God that can absolutely change your life, but you've got to invite him to come in Amen. to be your Savior right. and to be your Lord. Or life will stay just the way that it is. Christians, how long is it going to be? How much more are you going to take before you send him this morning that invitation that he's waiting on to come in and to take care of the mess that you're in this morning? Let's stand, please, as our heads are...